is the, yes, it is working. Um, so I'm not going to introduce the uh, Mr. Mitsotakis. I tend to feel that most people in the room probably know who he is. And I'm not going to introduce myself because it doesn't matter if you don't know who I am. <laughs> and, but I am going to make one announcement. We've started 25 minutes late. We will not end 25 minutes late. My plan is to end at 9.30. Uh, and that's basically what's going to happen. So, uh, because I believe in deadlines, that's, uh, that's the basis of my working life. So I'm going to start right now by talking to you about uh, the economy. So the Greek economy has stopped declining. It's, it's stabilized. It, uh, indeed, it is growing. Uh, after what one can only describe as an interesting hiccup, uh, the Syriza government has been implementing the program. Or at least that's what the people who run the program think. And it is expected that in the course of this year, um, the, uh, the program will be deemed to have succeeded. So should we regard the government as having been a very considerable success. Well, I think I have uh, my reasonable doubts about your statement. What you see is a uh, small cyclic and rebound rather than a sustained recovery. We're still underperforming the EU average when it comes to growth. And uh, if you take into consideration that we have lost 25% of our GDP over the past eight years, one cannot be happy with a growth rate of 1.5%. So in my mind, this has been an unqualified failure. And it has been an unqualified failure because if you turn the clock back to 2014, at the time the projections were calling for a growth that would be closer to 3% for the three years between 2015 and 2017, i.e. what more or less happened in Portugal. We didn't do that, and we didn't do that for very specific reasons. Uh, we're still paying a price for the first six months of uh, 2015. Now, as far as the reforms are concerned, um, we have a, an aggressive fiscal consolidation that is using the wrong fiscal policy mix. We'll probably get to the real reforms later, but I would very much question the assumption that real reforms are taking place in Greece today. If anything, good reforms that were implemented by the previous government are being undone. <coughs> So you think that the, the, the EU officials uh, overseeing the program are basically allowing the government to get away with murder? What I'm saying is that there is a general desire by everyone to see this program come to an end. And because the desire is so strong, yes, uh, a blind eye is being turned to significant reforms that are not being implemented. I'm talking about public administration, education, justice, just three categories where I think there has been significant backtracking. Uh, the Greek fatigue uh, is not just the fatigue of the Greek population, it's also the fatigue of the institutions. Whether this uh, is uh, uh, being taken into consideration by our creditors is a question to be um, uh, to be asked. But uh, yes, I think that a uh, blind eye has been turned to specific reform areas where I see a lot of backtracking. Do you think that it would be helpful for Greece if the creditors were tougher? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily, because I think that at some, at some point there's been so much talk about the ownership of reform, uh, it tends to become uh, almost a boring discussion, but it is very much true. This government does not own the reform agenda. It's a hard left government that is forced to implement a liberal agenda only to stay in power. So it's not a question of the reform, adopting a real uh, and forward-looking reform agenda um, for the future. This never really happened. It sort of happened during the previous government, not to the extent that I would like, I hope it will happen with the future government because the end of the program does not mean the end of the difficulties for the Greek economy. So let's talk about, let's, before we get to how you're going to get there, let's assume you are in power uh, in the next year or two. We can discuss the timing of the election later. Um, and 
let's assume for the moment you have a majority, but you still have a deeply divided country, which is profoundly shocked by an immense crisis, a huge recession, and stagnation. So this is far worse than a lost decade. Mm. Um, so what are you going to do to lift everybody's spirits and get the economy going? Well, for, number one priority has to be to create jobs. In order to create jobs, we need to attract investment. In order to attract investment, we need a, a stable political environment, uh, a government that is going to make a convincing case about why there are lots of investment opportunities in Greece, a stable tax regime, uh, a relative amount of deregulation, and a properly functioning banking system. So these, this would be the number one priority, because there's no better way to lift people out of the poverty trap than to find jobs. The current government is not doing that. It likes the logic of uh, overtaxing the productive economy to focus on uh, subsidies and handouts. That's why it's creating bigger primary surpluses than what is actually necessary. I don't like that logic. I prefer opportunities to handouts. So the number one priority has to be an investment-driven growth in sectors where Greece has a natural comparative advantage. At the same time, we need to rethink our social cohesion policies. I'm a big fan of a minimum guaranteed income scheme as a universal tool to support uh, the weakest Greeks. It was implemented by the previous government. It's being sort of implemented by the current government, but we also need to send a clear signal that uh, we're not going to let uh, you know, the, the poorest Greeks uh, fall, fall behind. Obviously, there's a lot, there are lots of nuances and lots of complication uh, in, what I'm, in what I'm describing, but uh, the priority, number one priority has to be investments and jobs. The Greece is committed um, in the long term to a pretty tough fiscal stance with uh, uh, ongoing primary surpluses for the indefinite future. How big a problem do you think that is? Can you achieve what you want with this framework and with anything like the current debt stock and debt, um, and debt uh, burden? You wrote an article, your last piece on Greece in June 2016. God, you remember better than I do. Where you made the case um, that uh, the primary surpluses, in one of your scenarios that you presented, that the primary surpluses that have been agreed by the government are essentially unreachable or unsustainable. Indeed, uh, it is very difficult to envision how you can grow an economy with a very, very tight fiscal policy. This is what has been currently agreed by the current government. Can it be renegotiated? Under certain conditions, yes. It would not be my number one priority. My number one priority would be to restore the credibility of the Greek government and to focus on supply side reforms. Once these have been implemented after the first six to 12 months, I think the question needs to be raised. Greece needs more fiscal space to break out of this vicious cycle. But one needs to be very clear what one wants to do with the additional fiscal space. One of the reasons our creditors have been so tough on Greece has to do with this perennial fear that if we give the Greeks fiscal space, they will spend it uh, on increasing the side of the state and hiring people right, left, and center. I'm committed not to do that. So whatever fiscal space I could negotiate, if that were possible, I would primarily redirect it towards further tax cuts to fuel whatever um, recovery we can generate through the structural reforms. I think it is a, a convincing argument. I think it fits into the broader question of how do we reduce our debt. Uh, the numbers do add up, we've done the math. So you can get a, uh, a debt right down to the extent that it will be accepted by our creditors with slightly lower primary surpluses, assuming slightly higher growth rates. Basically, the fundamental assumption that uh, is behind what I'm describing is that we have to convince the creditors, the international financial community, uh, skepticists like, uh, 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 healthy skepticists like yourself, that Greece is reformable. Because behind all the, uh, the analysis that you also wrote about, the pessimistic analysis of the IMF, uh, is, is a fundamental assumption that we can never deliver the real reforms. Hence, our growth rate is always going to be uh, below what uh, needs to be expected. Hence, we need a bigger debt write down, and then the numbers don't add up. And that's why we found ourselves in this mess. So let's consider what is needed to become credible in the way that you've suggested, which is both policy, which you've talked about, and the politics. Indeed, it is clear that foreign investors 
as well as your creditors and lots of observers have become pretty cynical let's be realistic about Greece and when they look back over the last say 15 20 years they would say that pretty well not pretty well they would say all the major parties when in, in government have made a except when forced to do otherwise, really forced, have made a spectacular mess of it, including your own party back in the early 2000s. So what is different this time? Why, what are you able to bring to the party which could, should convince the world out there who you need to be successful that it's going to be different? First of all, can it be done? Have other countries done it? Yes. Look at Argentina. Uh, you have a competent... I would use a word which never has positive nuances in Greece, but I have no difficulty using it, technocratic government coming in after a, a wave of populism, relatively quickly restored confidence, attracted a lot of foreign investment, is clearly moving the country in the right direction. So it, it, it can be done. We have to make a case that we have also changed our own attitudes uh, as, as a party. I know there is skepticism. Uh, where do we start? First of all, by presenting a very coherent and well thought out policy program for the next years, by changing faces, by bringing in new talent, and by making a very clear commitment that uh, you know, we, have to, we have to change and we have to stick to the reforms. Is it going to be a leap of faith? To a certain extent, yes. Uh, and I'm asking people to also trust me personally that I can deliver. Uh, on these policies. Do I have the credibility to do it? I've been a consistent reformer throughout my political career. I don't intend to make a U-turn now. So, so look at your party. Um, it's a, like all parties, a coalition of many different elements, some of which might not be looking at the history, anything like as enthusiastic about the liberal rules-governed, law-governed sort mm -hmm. of polity you're putting forward. <coughs> Are you really in control of it? I have, I have a strong mandate because I got elected through an open public vote. Uh, I presented my candidacy. I was an outsider. Nobody expected. Nobody thought I could win. I think I won because it was a real desire for, uh, for real uh, change. The party is uh, fully aligned and fully committed to this agenda. Uh, of course, it's a big party. Uh, and, of course, we have to uh, make sure that we aggregate different views. But as far as the reform component of our economic program is concerned, there is no real other voice within, uh, within the party. This is the direction we're going, uh, and this is non-negotiable. If you look at the ele electoral arithmetic of Greece, the arrangements you have on the next election, I understand you have a lead of about 10 percentage points in the polls, which doesn't strike me this far out as a very comfortable cushion. How confident really are you that you can win a, a genuine governing majority or at least create a coalition which gives you the capacity to generate firm rule in doing things, the reforms you've set out are clearly going to upset an awful lot of vested interests. So are you... Are you reasonably confident you can get the power you will need? I am. People are very tired with the current government. Mr. Tsipras has disappointed and deceived lots of people. Uh, he's currently focusing much more on dividing the country rather than uniting it towards uh, a, common, a common goal. I'm optimistic, Martin, because I think that uh, fundamental changes have taken place in Greek society that not many people uh, necessarily realize. There is a, a greater belief than there was in the past that uh, uh, private investment, private entrepreneurship is a way forward. Uh, when we ask people do they want uh, a bigger state with more benefits or a smaller state with less benefits, a majority answers we actually want a smaller state with, with less benefits, we want to have more control uh, of, our own, uh, of our own lives. People expect politicians to tell them the truth because they've been deceived by systematic lies. So I think there is a, an undercurrent that is working in our direction. What is working against us? Cynicism, skepticism, uh, a general disappointment vis-a-vis -vis the entire political system. So these are the two forces. One is working in our direction, the other is working uh, against us. But uh, yes, not just by looking at the polls, but through my systematic campaigning, 
I am confident that we can win not just an electoral victory, that is probably not sufficient, but a very clear political mandate for change. And this is what I'll be, this is what I'll be asking for in the next elections, and I think we have a reasonable chance of achieving that goal. Some people think that the economy might grow this year by somewhere two, two and a half, maybe even three percent. Would that change, you think, the, the political arithmetic, and it, arithmetic? The government would then be able to say, look, we have, we are, we've gone through the painful medicine and now growth is returning. Why risk all these radical and upsetting reforms which are being put forward? Uh, uh, fair question. I don't think we will grow uh, at uh, two and a half, three percent. Uh, even, even if we do, uh, I think the policies of the government are not necessarily designed in a way to achieve a real trickle-down effect, so I don't think people will actually feel that, uh, that growth. Uh, and uh, I don't think that there is a real chance that the electoral dynamic uh, is going to change until the, until the actual campaign. Again, if we manage a better growth, so much the better for, for the country. But uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be about uh, coming up with an agenda after the end of the program, because there's a big elephant in the room, and that is what will happen after August 2018. Of course, of course. Can I turn now to a third? We've talked about the economy and reform. We talked about politics. I'd like to talk to you about institutions. Mm -hmm. um, this is both a long-standing concern and a more immediate concern. The long-standing concern has been widely felt outside the country that institutions of governance and institutions of law don't operate in a modern way, they don't operate in a neutral way, um, st structures are highly clientelist, um, and then there's a more recent issues, I've just arrived, it's pretty obvious about the rule of law, uh, core issues of the rule of law. Um, how important an issue, in your view, is the current state of institutions and the values embodied in institutions in Greece? Is it getting worse or is it getting better? And then let's move to how you can change something so profoundly difficult to change. It is critical, it's moving in the wrong direction, and it needs to be changed. Now, let me el elaborate. Greece's failure is more political and institutional than it is economic. I'm a big believer that institutions matter and that there is a direct correlation between the quality of the institutions and the quality of our democracy and prosperity. Uh, hence, if we don't improve the quality of our institutions, we will be underperforming systematically in the future. In the future. So this, this is absolutely critical. Has so it this is a central part <coughs> this of is a central your part reform of, program. Absolutely, ab absolutely central. Is it getting worse? It is getting worse. I have a theory that all populist governments, whether they come from the right or from the left, have more or less the same playbook when they get into, into power, and that is to try to control the media, uh, intervene in justice, and go after their political opponents. We've seen all three with this government, so yes, things have gotten worse. There is no doubt whatsoever that the government is intervening in justice in a manner that is completely unacceptable for a modern uh, democratic state, uh, and this is done by clear directions from the very top of the government. How do you change it? Is this like what we see in countries like Poland or Hungary? There are similarities, yes. There are, there are similarities. It is not flattering for Greece, but it is the truth. Uh, and uh, the issues of rule of law matter. Uh, I'm not talking necessarily about the European dimension of the problem. I'm talking about the Greek dimension of the problem. Uh, these, uh, the level of intervention we've seen in justice is point blank unacceptable. It is unacceptable that the Prime Minister hires uh, the, uh, the head of the Greek Supreme Court as a special counsel a day after she retires. These practices are completely unacceptable and they constitute a clear breach of the uh, distinction uh, uh, of, uh, of power that uh, undermines the core uh, of, uh, of, of every uh, democracy. So, the question is, now, how do you change it? Uh, and uh, my answer is, is twofold. The first is, um, you need to be absolutely meritocratic in the choice of people that staff the government. Uh, and uh, I do intend to do that, starting from the ministerial appointments to the apparatus of, uh, of, of the state. Uh, people matter. Until you build the institutions, 
people matter a lot. So how, how would, I understand it for minutes about that, so what sort of reforms would be required to make the bureaucracy a well, meritocracy? The first thing you need is, uh, which is our number one piece of legislation, it's slightly technical but very important, it's how do you actually run the government. Uh, and this is our, going to be our first piece of legislation. What is the role of the Prime Minister's office? Uh, how does it, uh, interfe how does it uh, conduct policy with the ministries? What's the level of secretary generals that you need? Uh, so it's, it's a comprehensive package that we have essentially already written, which is the functioning of the government itself. We have a very institutionally very powerful Prime Minister who doesn't necessarily have the instruments to implement um, uh, what, the, what the, power, the power that actually uh, arises from his office. Eventually, we will need a very bold constitutional amendment process, which we have thought a lot about. We will be presenting it over the next months. Um, you probably don't know, but you need two parliaments to actually change your constitution. So this is a long-term process. It is absolutely necessary. Our constitution uh, has outlived its utility. Uh, we need a, a new constitutional framework for the, for the Greece that I at least envision. And obviously to do that you need two terms. One of the cases that it's attracted enormous attention internationally, and in fact the, probably one of the few or perhaps only specific court case that the FT has written an editorial about in another country is the case of the prosecution of the former head of your statistics service for what we and Eurostat believes is telling the truth. Could you explain to someone like me how on earth this could happen <laughs> and um, what we should understand about the operation of government and law that makes that possible? I've uh, publicly refrained from making public comments about any court cases. What I can say, it's about time to put this issue to rest. Okay, well that's suitably diplomatic. Um, the, um, one of the areas which the, the, the creditors paid a lot of attention to was the functioning of the tax bureaucracy. So that's a central issue, yeah. always been a big discussion in Greece. Um, where do you think that is? Because there, there is a view out there that the, in a lot of areas things haven't improved that much, that actually the tax, the tax bureaucracy has become more effective. Do you agree with that or, or not? Is that an area where actually these programs have brought some real success? Well, we, we fought very hard um, to establish a truly independent tax authority. It has been established. There's been a, there was and there still is a lot of resistance. It needs to be further supported. It's doing a better job than, than previously was, was the case. However, unfortunately, the, the government uh, is constantly trying to bypass it by giving uh, special prosecutors within uh, the Justice Department uh, the right to also conduct audits. So it doesn't seem to be very happy with the independent authority. I intend to, to strengthen it. Some people say the government is actually using these powers to persecute people. Would, it is, you, would you agree I with would that? I would, I, would agree, I would agree with that uh, statement that there has been uh, uh, selective um, um, discrimination against people uh, by uh, parts of the, uh, of the tax authorities and, and the judicial. So yes, that has, been, that has been the case, but there has been an improvement. We have access to a lot, to significant amount of data that we did not have access before. We need to use that data judiciously. I think that there is still significant room to improve tax compliance in Greece through basic big data uh, analytics. That we're just we're just scratching the surface of, of what we uh, of what we can uh, what we can do. Do you think <laughs> delicate sort of question, But do you think Greek people, broadly speaking? are prepared to accept the idea that they should pay their taxes? I think they're, they will be prepared to accept that idea provided we start lowering their taxes. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting... Presumably the quality of the services yeah, you provide what, what I, is quite important, isn't it? People are, people are tax evading in Greece today. They're tax evading for two reasons. First of all, because taxes are, are, are way too high. And uh, when, you, when you're a self-employed lawyer and you feel that you're paying between 70 and 80% of your income to the state, 
there's a case to be, to be made of why you may be reluctant to do that. It's not an excuse, it's the reality. It's happening, uh, and it's happening as a result of a very specific policy. So I think the deal is very fair. We lower taxes, you improve tax compliance. We're going to be brutally harsh with people who tax evade, but we will also lower taxes. Uh, and uh, there is a case to be made why this will include improved tax compliance. We did it back in 2013. Uh, we actually lowered um, VAT for restaurants. And what we saw was that there was no real revenue shortfall. Uh, whenever you go today, there is rampant tax evasion. Um, uh, you, I, I heard you're going on a nice trip to Greece. Um, check out uh, afterwards, uh, check out how many tax receipts you will get in the nice tavernas you will visit. Uh, probably not many. Uh, so if you, re if you decrease that or if you decrease the tax burden, you will, in you will improve tax compliance. It is, uh, we've tried it, it has worked. So the, the deal is, I think in my mind, very fair. Actually, I have to say, in the, the taverna we've been in so far, they've been giving us so many receipts, I don't know what to do with them. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been almost... Be careful, sometimes uh, it, may, it may just be the ledger for, <laughs> for your order, which is, not, which is not the same as a receipt. Might be... Almost, Maybe they recognize you. They uh, think you're someone... No, yeah. no, I'm sure they didn't. Yeah. Um, one final question on domestic policy. Um, surely what you set out probably means that you're going to have to cut spending. So people don't like it when people, governments cut spending. So what spending are you going to cut? And how are the people going to respond? Well, is there still room to cut spending? Yes. Not, not huge amounts. But let me give you an example. The wage bill for the public administration has increased by almost half, uh, half a billion um, under this government. We're still probably hiring more people than we should, especially through temporary contracts. All these needs to stop. There is still waste in several areas which are, which are very important. Look at, for example, public transportation. Nobody, we introduced a new electronic ticket system. It's not working. Nobody's paying for, for the tickets. I mean, uh, it's basically a free for all. Uh, the end result, the deficits of our, of, of our big um, uh, public transport companies uh, have ballooned. Healthcare, no cooperation, essential cooperation with the private sector, no real effort to actually cut spending in a targeted way and to actually improve, um, uh, improve services. Significant room through public-private partnerships to improve, not just to cut spending, but also to improve um, the level of service. Even when it comes to drug spending, which is a hot issue these days, uh, for reasons which I'm sure you yes. you are aware of, we've we've slashed prices, but we've done very little to slash the volume, the number of prescriptions that have been written. So the number of prescriptions have actually increased uh, during the past three years, uh, with no particular health benefit, I would argue. Do we have the data to 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 look at all this? The answer is yes. So I think. There is still a lack of serious managerial discipline when it comes to, to managing and doing proper spending reviews for the public administration. It's not going to save us a fortune, but I think symbolically it's going to be very important for the markets to address these pockets of excess spending wherever they exist. Where do you stand and have you stood on this perennially vexed issue between Greek governments and creditors, namely pension spending? Pension spending has been slashed, and uh, what too far? Too far. Um, one can make the case that it has been slashed in the wrong way. I mean, lots of people have obviously been reduced to something like destitution. Uh, one can make the case that certainly pension cuts went too far, and they didn't, and, and they and they went too far in, in a horizontal manner. And not only that, we have further pension cuts that have been legislated by Mr. Tsipras that will kick in on January 1st, 2019. Have we changed our system? We have not changed our system. We need to rethink our pension system and basically implement what we call a fundamental three-pillar system where the second uh, and the third pillar are not going to be on a pay-as-you-go uh, basis, uh, but will uh, establish more ownership of, of, the, of the contributions. And we need to do the same both for pensions and for healthcare. So in my mind, yes, there is still another pension reform 
ahead of us, and we need to be very open. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will entail further spending cuts, but we need to think about the system for the next generation. If you talk to average Greeks, younger people, they will tell you, I'm paying my contributions, I'm never going to get a pension. We cannot go on by giving you know, the younger generation no hope that they will ever receive a pension. People feel that they pay their contributions and it all goes into a pit without any transparency and any ownership. So, we, I mean, these are pension reforms. They take a long time. You need big transitional periods to implement them so that you make them in a, uh, you, you do them in a, in a fair way. But other countries have done them. We need to have this debate in Greece as well. A couple of quick questions on foreign policy. Well, they both have immensely powerful domestic issues. Where do you stand on the efforts to find a solution to the name, and therefore the place in some sense, of what is now called the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia? As I know it's an incredibly hot potato mm -hmm. uh, here. What is your view of what the government is trying to do and what you should be trying to do if you were in power to resolve this issue? I think the government messed this up, uh, this issue up completely from the very beginning. Instead of trying to forge a true national consensus, inviting you know, all parties uh, and uh, forge a common position, they went on their own. They basically divided the country. They labeled anyone who opposed you know, a solution that includes the name Macedonia as uh, belonging to the far right. They didn't understand that this issue is emotionally very important for many Greeks and that it is essentially the expression of identity politics in Greece uh, today. They essentially divided the country and uh, also tried to divide the opposition. And I think they also made a big tactical mistake. They did not, uh, from the very beginning, stipulate that uh, our northern neighbor needs to change the constitution to make sure that whatever is agreed is enshrined in a constitutional um, amendment. So. Uh, right now, I uh, do, and also they never convinced their junior coalition partner that they should join the efforts. So you have a sort of an oxymoron that Mr. Tsipras is negotiating on this issue, not as the head of the government, but as the head of Syriza, because his junior coalition partner does not support any solution on the issue. This raises parliamentary issues, um, but it also raises real political issues. So Mr. Tsipras is uh, on, on, on his own in this. I think the window for a reasonable solution is closing very fast. So you're suggesting that if you gain power uh, in the next election, you will no longer be able to resolve this? What I'm, what I'm saying is uh, that uh, the way Mr. Tsipras handled this has uh, inflamed uh, feelings, has divided Greek society, and has made the solution more difficult rather than less difficult. The second foreign policy question I want to talk about is refugees. This has obviously been a huge issue for Greece. You're very exposed uh, because of your location. You're, you, you're a country in some difficulty. Um, tell me how you can fix that. The refugee problem is, is no longer a, a very significant problem for Greece in the sense that uh, the number of refugees that actually come across the Aegean has been significantly reduced. It's a local problem. Uh, on the islands uh, of the north uh, uh, eastern Aegean Sea. Uh, uh, the government has mismanaged the problem from an operational perspective. But uh, it is no longer, as we speak, a, a, a big problem the for flow Greece. Has stopped. Uh, the flow has it hasn't stopped completely, but it has been significantly uh, reduced. So it is no longer a major problem for Greece. A much more important problem is our, the state of our overall relationship with Turkey. That's, an or, that's a problem of a different, different order. I think I'm going to, what I'm going to do, since we're very close to half past, I'll take three questions and then we'll have people, they'll be one sentence questions, please say who you are, one sentence questions, I will organize them and that will be the end of our fascinating discussion. Uh, and does anybody want to ask a question of Mr. Mitsotakis? No? You seem to have intimidated everyone. Uh, no, you've intimidated, you're so articulate. Uh, uh, oh yes, there's a gentleman. Is there somebody? No, I can't see. I'm afraid the light is in my eye. Please, uh, there's a microphone. If you'll be good enough to say who you are and one sentence. John Roberts with the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. 
Not a question, just asking Mr. Mitsotakis whether he would elaborate on how you think future relations with Turkey should be. Okay. 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 We'll take all three questions and ask them. Okay, yeah. uh, that's a very good question. Uh, any other questions or? The, yes, um, could you bring the microphone to this gentleman? Hello, uh, my name is Argiris Papastathis. I'm a journalist from Proto Thema newspaper. I would like to ask both of you if the recent polarization in the Greek political scene uh, around this Novartis issue could uh, wake up the so-called beast of the uh, political risk or country risk that we have seen eating out many of our uh, pros prospects uh, in the previous years despite the efforts of the Greek people. So whether it will lead to actual political um, instability. Yeah. instability. Okay, it's a very good question. Uh, one last question. Ah, yes, there's somebody. Could you stand up, please? Uh, yes, please. Can you see the gentleman standing up there? You can answer these in any length, and yeah. th that will determine, well, five minutes max. Uh, Dionysis Rigopoulos. Uh, nowadays, that there is real-time uh, observation of every single parcel that is traveling around the world, the Greek state still does not know its units and its staffing, the current situation. Unless we have that, we cannot proceed to EGAV or to reforms. What is the position for that? This is something that can be done in a month. Okay, uh, fairly straightforward questions. Well, First, you fix Greek-Turkish relations. I'll answer them in reverse order. Then, because, then, yeah. then, okay, start with the parcels. Because Mr. Rigopoulos has already the plan, so it's not difficult to actually have a, uh, a, a, a digital map uh, of the entire structure of the Greek state. Uh, it can be done, maybe not in a month, but certainly in a finite period of time. We need more transparency about Greek structures, about the number of civil servants, uh, and uh, in itself this will create more, uh, more accountability, but we're on the same page as far as this is concerned. Polarization. It's a big problem. It's a big problem because we are at the level of public discourse that is, in my mind, unacceptable uh, for, for, a modern, uh, for a modern democracy and certainly not in line with what the people expect and what the people want. Is it just a, a Greek problem? No. It's also a, a problem for other Western democracies. But the reason why we are in this context uh, is, is very clear. It's, it was a government and it still remains a government's very, very clear decision to focus on these corruption issues rather than talking about you know, the big issues of the future. So I'm afraid uh, it's going to be a nasty campaign. Uh, I don't think uh, there are clear winners and losers when, we, uh, when, uh, when mud's slowing uh, you know, in, in all directions, but we will talk about the issues we discussed today, you know, about the future, about investments, about jobs, about public services. And I think there's going to be an audience that actually would want us to move past this toxic environment. One last point on this issue, the government is shooting itself in the foot with what it's doing. On the one hand, it's making the case that Greece is becoming a normal country. On the other hand, it's doing everything it can to sort of uh, uh, make people who are not very knowledgeable about Greece uh, frightful about the state of Greek uh, uh, politics. So there's a fundamental uh, incompatibility between the, between the two positions. Now, Greek-Turkish uh, relations, we are all concerned about the level of tension in the Aegean. Uh, and I've made this very, very clear both to President Erdogan when I saw him and to Prime Minister Hildirim when, when I saw him 10 days ago in Munich that we, we need rapid de-escalation uh, in, the, in the Aegean in order to avoid an accident that could have uh, grave consequences for the overall uh, stability of, uh, uh, of the region. Uh, I'm a firm believer in Greek-Turkish friendship. Uh, and uh, I'm a believer that uh, we can work on a framework regardless of the relation between Turkey and the, the EU that will promote Greek-Turkish relations. In order to do that, we need to look less at the domestic political agenda. We need less grandstanding and using these, uh, these, these topics sort of to bolster our, uh, our sort of internal popularity. It has been happening in Turkey, uh, I'm afraid, but at the end of the day, 
I think it is the interest of Turkey, which has lots of uh, open foreign policy fronts, to have a good working relationship with Greece and, for that matter, also with, uh, uh, with Europe. But we need sensible people with sensible politics. Uh, we don't need to, um, to pretend that we're you know, big, uh, big, big generals uh, wearing uh, you know, nice military suits, uh, uh, as uh, sometimes our Minister of Defense is doing. Um, not very helpful uh, in general uh, when uh, um, uh, sort of foreign policy is, uh, is, is taken over by these sort of practices. So I promised it would end at half past nine. I've, I've missed by four minutes, which I think is probably really reasonable in the circumstances. I think it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.